And All right, and just a heads up, I did start recording this meeting. Great, thank you, Rob. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, welcome to the Amherst Design Review Board meeting of December 18th, 2023. My name is Erica Zekas, and as the chair of the Amherst Design Review Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 5.01. This meeting is being recorded and I will and will be made available via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended again by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. A hyperlink to the hearing will be posted on the town's online calendar. Board members, I will take roll call. When I call your name, please answer affirmatively. Catherine Porter. Here. Lindsay Schnarr. Here. Pat Oth. Present. And uh, Karen Winter is not joining us this evening, and Eric Zikos, present. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, please remember to re-mute yourself. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment could also be heard at other times during the meeting when determined appropriate. Please indicate that you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you've joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate that you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when you're finished. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be discontinued from the meeting. Tonight's agenda includes the following. Uh, we have one application, DRB FY 2024-09, Town of Amherst. Uh, to conduct uh, construct a three-story elementary school uh, on the Fort River site. We have approval of meeting minutes, general public comment period, and other business. And if it um, is okay with uh, with the the board, I'd like to move general public comment period forward um, in this meeting in case there are folks in attendance who are also trying to get to the town council meeting tonight. I I don't know how long our review is going to take. So um, I would ask Rob for, uh, or ask the, the public if, if you are in attendance and you'd like to make a comment uh, to let us know. So this can be done by uh, either, either using the raise hand function or by pressing star nine if you're on the telephone. And again, this is for general public comment. I guess we'll give people a minute or two. Sure. So I'm not seeing any hands up at the moment. Um, so I would assume that there is no public comment for okay. tonight's meeting. Great. So we'll move we'll on to, um, to hearing uh, about the Fort River Elementary School, and we can always uh, look for comment uh, after the, the um, after the introduction to the project. Sorry, loss of words. Um, so, I, there are some folks in attendance who would like to present. So, I believe we have um, the architect presenting tonight. Um... Let me see if I can go ahead and promote them to panelists. Hi, Mr. Cooper. 
Good evening. Is anybody else joining you on the screen this evening? Uh, Rick Rice, if his, he is in the gallery, should be joining us from Tedesco Design. And he just got a panelist invitation. There he is. Okay. All righty. And Mr. Rice, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I just have a, a little bit of a, a, a reminder for um, everyone, and that is that um, to members of the DRB and our presenters, the DRB will focus our comments on the exterior expression of the building and its landscape. We are definitely interested in all the things that happen inside um, the planning and design of the building, but it's not in our scope except as um, what's happening on the inside shows up in the building's form, like location of apertures, materials, et cetera. So DRB members, if you could remember to limit your comments and questions to what's happening on the outside of the building, that will help our conversation along. Um, and after your presentation, I'm going to move the DRB kind of through the nine design review standards to guide our conversation. Uh, there's a fair amount of redundancy in these, so uh, bear with us. And some things actually don't apply, but we're going to um, do our due diligence um, with this project. So thank you for, for hearing me out. And um, do you have the ability to share your screen? I will test that ability right now. And you can just walk us through your your project and we'll listen and take notes. Sure. Um, if at any time I am going into too much or not enough detail, just let me know and I can uh, expand or uh, move along as you so desire. But uh, I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, starting with uh, an existing site plan, uh, just to uh, give uh, a feel of what's on the site now, the existing uh, Fort River Elementary School occupies the north half of the site. It's off Southeast Street. It has parking for about 175 spots and two connections to Southeast Street. Uh, and then there's a good amount of playing fields to the east and south. Uh, the building itself, uh, we have not heard a lot of comments that um, there is much to preserve or pay homage to in terms of architecture or uh, program educational value. So. Moving to the redeveloped site, um, the new building will be three stories occupying the southern port of the site. Uh, part of that is so that it can be built while the existing school is fully operational during construction. Uh, part of that is to maximize the field space, parking, and circulation. You can see that the southern access drive is bus and service only with space for vans. And then parent and staff will use the north entrance circling through the parking lot. And there's a drop off area adjacent to the main entrance and plaza at the west side of the building. North of the building are playgrounds and outdoor eating areas adjacent to the cafeteria, um, full size basketball courts and half size basketball courts uh, at the east side of the building. Um, then on the further east and to the southeast, there are components designed specifically for outdoor education. Uh, there is a microforest garden, planter gardens, a pollinator garden, and then an outdoor sheltered classroom. The main playground is in between the building and the athletic fields to the north. Um, it is uh, currently designed as a port in place play service and the structures of the playground itself are yet to be designed. Uh, they will be designed this spring. Uh, the dashed lines over the southern part of the canopy, the southern part of the parking lot are the canopies that will support the PV. Uh, they are in this location so that they can be built while the existing school is still operational so that the school can be net zero on day one. Um, the building is three stories for multiple reasons, one of which travel distance are actually easier, um, shorter, I should say, for people to get from one part of the building to another rather than spreading it all out on one floor. Another part is we are dealing with high water table and so that decreases the footprint and the amount of impervious area on site. And then north of the school development itself, we have athletic fields, which can be used for the school, obviously, recess, 
very sports, but it's also a community asset that will be developed as part of the site. And then quickly moving into the building to give context to the discussion of what's on the outside. Um, entering the main entrance at the west end of the building, uh, the administration the office is immediately inside to the south, to your right as you walk in. The cafeteria and the music classroom with the associated practice spaces is to your left. And then right past the administration is the gym. So these are the two major spaces that will be used by the public um, outside of the school population. And then moving past those spaces, you move into the academic part of the school with uh, classes grouped by grade in six classrooms, clusters of three on either side of the corridor. Uh, and those are lockable from the public part of the school if there should be something that happens during the day, uh, voting or something like that. Moving up in the building, uh, the media center, excuse me, is on the second floor above the cafeteria and the classroom configuration remains the same on the first, second, and third floor. So it's kindergarten first on the second, first and second on the third. Moving up. The two uh, art, and STEM classroom are on the second floor adjacent to the library. And then moving up through the building, we have the third floor of classrooms and the mechanical room on the third floor, uh, mm -hmm. literacy library that doubles as uh, professional development space. So with that, we move to the exterior, starting from the north elevation. Um, there's a, starting from the east, the west end, uh, the right looking from the north is the main entrance. Uh, you can see the canopy that covers the front door and then the clear story glass that defines the volume of the lobby and the library on the second floor, the cafeteria, the public spaces in the building where the entire school and the community at large uses them. Those are individually identified and uh, the massing is apparent on the exterior. So as we move around the building, you'll see that the roof lines change and the volumes are legible on the outside for the gymnasium, the cafeteria, the library, and the main administration space. And then the classroom wing themselves is uh, a sort of pattern with a, a bit more regular, but the there is some play in the exterior materials. We have a basic palette of masonry with composite aluminum panel where we mark entrances and want a little pop of color. But the main uh, palette is uh, brick using two moderately contrasting field colors, a, a, a medium iron spot, and then a blend of grays with accents of glazed masonry near windows. Moving around to the south, the part T is similar. You can see the roof is sloped at the main administration. The gymnasium is its own volume. Um, the entrance to the south to the bus loop um, has a stair immediately adjacent to it. So it's legible um, from the exterior and you can see light is led into the building through this glazing. It's a little more apparent here, but the same pattern in terms of the fabric of the building being the classrooms and that repeating from the center of the building to the east is shown here. On the north side, uh, there are no exterior sun control devices. And on the south side, there are to control glare. Um, the windows in the classrooms are actually quite large. They are nine feet tall. Um, uh, one of the guiding principles of the building was to let as much natural light in as possible. And then further between the classrooms that have this light coming in, there is clear story and very large side lights into the um, spaces outside of the classrooms and the corridors that connect them. Views of the west elevation, where you have the main entrance. This is part of the two double doors to the main vestibule and lobby. Um, clear story glazing uh, that illuminates the Lobby is facing north and west, so there will be some light getting in, but the glare will not be that much of an issue. And then here you can see the roof line of the media center, the gymnasium, and the music room.
partial elevations of the areas that are hidden. And then just a close up view of the fabric of the building to the east of the central stair. Uh, large windows, three per classroom, sun control devices with patterning in the brick in between. Uh, you know, it, it's a, a dance of how much undifferentiated brick you can have before we start to introduce a pattern to liven it up a little bit. Various other elements. This is looking at the edge of the canopy to the main entrance, uh, starting to do some brick patterning at the main administration area. This is a corner where the roof of the gymnasium turns down with windows beyond. Another close-up view. Uh, we do slightly different patterning as materials within the uh, Media Center Library. Um, one slide back, you saw a slightly different pattern at the gym just to give each element a slightly different look and feel so that they are legible from the outside. This is the main administration roof line in front of the gym. This is the east facade um, facing the woods on the site and there is a stair here. Um, actually, so here's a close up view of uh, the palette of materials. There is the uh, darker brick, it's a medium iron spot that we're looking at. And then the main lighter brick is going to be a blend, uh, but then where we have insert panels at the stairs and around the gym, we have a more solid version of the lighter color. And then this is the field of the gymnasium itself. Um, wherever you see the bright orange linear expressions on the elevations and the model I'm about to show, it's a composite aluminum panel. And then the accent panels next to the classroom windows are a spectroglaze or a composite on a CMU. Here are some overall views. This would be approaching on the top from the bus loop, the south entrance to the site. Uh, in the foreground, you can see the main entrance and the canopy over the entrance to the main lobby the roof line of the main administration and the clear story glass, the gym and the media center. Tim, I hate to interrupt you, but do you think, is it possible to zoom in on those images while you're talking about them? I can. Thank you, that's great. Sorry, it's a little jumpy. So gymnasium, the uh, glazing at the corner is angled a little bit, sort of to mirror the roof line. Um, there is some equipment that's going to be visible on the roof, but the majority of it is at the roof of the gym level and it will be screened. And then here you can see um, the canopy mounted PV as you approach from the south. Um, and this is the bus loop. So this is the view you would have looking back after drop off or leaving the site, but um, you know, it's, it's a good size building and a good size site. So you have to take a step back to see the whole thing. Um, the main entrance is behind this line of trees, but here you can see the prominence of the media center, the glazing at the cafeteria, and then the classroom wing beyond. Uh, here are a few more views, but I think it might be best if we just switch to the model that will, will allow me to go around the building. So starting at the main entrance, um, walking through the plaza that is defined by the drop-off loop to, on the left of the screen to the north, going through the parking lot, and the bus loop to the south. And then... The name of the school has not been decided yet, but that is a likely location for the signage. Um, there are also opportunities for art on the exterior, which we are showing here, but again, that is in process of the location and the design. Uh, as we are right now, we are looking past the bike racks to the music room, cafeteria, media center. Um, this view is taken 
from the middle of where the playground will be. Uh, there is no equipment shown because it is designed. This door connects directly to the central stair that will allow kids to come up and go down to recess. Uh, here you see the main bulk of the classrooms facing north without sun control. And moving around to the east side of the building where you have basketball courts. Uh, beyond the basketball courts where you see the planting area, there are stormwater features that can be connected to the uh, educational curriculum. It's a rain garden. Some patterning in the brick on the east side of the building to, uh, you know, this, this is the least articulated uh, wall of the building. So we introduced some patterns to break it up. And then as we come around to the southeast, you can see the outdoor planter gardens, the structure that will serve as an outdoor classroom. And then we're getting toward the bus entrance and the stair that will connect all three floors. The service area is tucked in here behind the gym and the south entrance to the building. And then here we are moving back toward the gymnasium and eventually to the front of the building. We have a other, well, that is what we have presented. And I would like to, you know, if you, there's more you'd like to see or know about, uh, let me know and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. I see Patricia has her hand up. Yeah, fantastic. I, um, I, I'm i going to, uh, I think, ask us to, I, I'm hopeful, <laughs> members, that you um, reviewed the the various uh, components. We, we are... I mean, this is such a significant project for the for the yes. town. So we um, really appreciate your your uh, review for us. It's great, and we've all received your documents in advance. Although the fly through is new, which is great to see. Um, our uh, the kind of nine design review standards include things like height and proportion and relations to structures and spaces and building shape, that kind of thing. Um, so Pat, do you have a comment that kind of falls outside of those or? It's, it's, it's probably outside of it, but you keep talking about main staircases. Is this building handicapped accessible with an elevator? Uh, yes, absolutely. So there is one elevator at the center of the building. Um, I can go to the plan to show you one second. Uh, So the main entrance is here. The elevator is here, centrally located in the building, um, adjacent to the entrance from the south. Um, and then I should note the one, all of the floors are completely flat with no level changes, except for the platform at the cafeteria with a ramp to the practice areas. And then on the second floor to accommodate ceiling height required in the cafeteria, the media center is 18 inches above the rest of the second floor, uh, but there yeah, is also uh, a ramp from the floor uh, proper to the media center. Okay, so sure. the building is fully accessible. Thank you. Okay. And I guess I just had one more question and and uh, then I'll, I'll listen. Um, is the bus drop off separate from the parent or the car drop off and pick up it is uh, in, in decisions with uh, the school administration, the town, it was figured that was the best for safety and the organized uh, organization of pick up and drop off. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, okay, so the first design review board standard is uh, about building height. This is the height of the, any proposed alteration should be compatible with the style and character of the building structure or site being altered and that of the surroundings. Um, 
given that there is very little in the immediate context. Um, my sense is that the building is appropriately scaled. And as you mentioned, you are you know, wrestling with um, you know, the density of the program and the footprint of the building for uh, drainage issues. There was there's a there's a, a note in the application that the RVC um, you're exceeding the building height of 35 feet. That's the kind of standard limit of the RVC. So you need a special permit. Um, but I think that that you know that's that's for the ZBA. Um, my sense is that the uh, to retain the openness of the site going to 43 feet is perfectly appropriate in this context. Um, does anybody else, any other members have a comment on building height? I would agree is uh, quite appropriate. And I wanted to also note that I the uh, creative uh, design uh, where the, it, the entrance is only like one story. And so there's, so when you come up to it, you don't even understand that maybe behind it are three uh, three stories, and I think that gives a very welcoming and uh, um, creative approach. Um, yeah, I like it. I like the entrance too. Thanks, Catherine. Pat, any comments on building height? No, I would tend to agree with you and Catherine that that um, given given the location and the spaciousness of the ground surrounding it, that it it would certainly be compatible with the neighborhood. Yeah. And Lindsay, camera's off, but you're welcome to comment if you have anything to say on this one. Okay, I'm gonna move on because there is, there's a ton of redundancy in these, especially on a site like this one that doesn't have the density of the downtown. Uh, the next standard is proportions. The proportions and relationships of height to width between windows, doors, signs, and other architectural elements should be compatible with the architectural style and character of the building or structure and that of the surroundings. Um, my thoughts are that uh, Denisco has done a really nice job of reducing the scale of the building, similar to Catherine's comment um, before. I, I feel that the um, the reducing the scale of the building at the entrance is really smart. And I think, you know, a building to serve hundreds of students and um, teachers and staff is necessarily large, but you've uh, kind of treated the building as a series of smaller stacked blocks um, with a primary point of entry at the middle, which really splits things up in a, in a nice way and helps to reduce the sense of this, you know, kind of overall mass. Um, and I really also appreciate the kind of darker cladding on the bottom two stories and getting lighter as you move up the building to help us feel like the scale is being reduced. Lindsay, do you have thoughts on uh, building proportion? Um, I I agree. I mean, I think that overall this the the I mean, I want to speak more to massing, but it's just the the way that the scale is is really broken down and play of materials is really, um, I think, successful in helping to keep it keep a very large building feeling not to, totally overwhelming and monolithic. So, um, I think you've done a beautiful job with that. Thanks, Catherine or Pat. Uh, I, I agree with both your comments. Thank you. So we'll move on to um, relation of structures and spaces. The relation of a structure to the open space between it and adjoining structures should be compatible with such relations in the surroundings. Um, I don't really see it as an issue here. There's no immediately adjacent buildings and no significant visibility from the neighbors. Anyone else on this? Okay. Shape. <laughs> The shape of the roofs, windows, doors, and other design elements should be compatible with the architectural style and character of the buildings or site and that of its surroundings. Anyone share thoughts on shape? 
I, I think that the mix of the sloped roof lines with the flat roof lines works really well, again, to um, create more of a play on the larger volumes, um, media center um, being that kind of <clears throat> most obvious focal point um, and like kind of playing down the classroom scale by leaving that as more of a flat roof line. Mm -hmm. um, I also really appreciate the use of materials to define the kind of linear elements and the wrapping elements. Um, I don't, I don't remember, Erica. Do we have a separate item for um, for materials specifically? There's not. Although number eight is architectural and site details, which references materials. Okay, so I'll hold the rest of that. But I think that overall, you know, the use of materials um, and roof lines to to create various shapes that, that work with proportions is really nice. Yeah. Agreed. Anyone else? Okay. So the next stop is uh, landscape. Any proposed landscape development or alteration should be compatible with the character and appearance of the surrounding area. Landscape and streetscape elements, including topography, plantings, and paving patterns should provide continuity and definition to the street, pedestrian areas, and surrounding landscape. Catherine or Pat, any? Go ahead, um, Pat. Yeah, I, I actually like the, the cluster of the, the landscaping. Um, it has it, 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 uh, design integrity, but it also um, leaves the building free for the flow of air and light. And, and it also kind of demarks the, the difference between the building area and the playing fields and the, and the playground. It's, it, it's nicely done, it's low, it's, it's I, I think it's, it's appropriate um, the way it was shown. Okay. Um, I, you know, you're proposing um, a significant change necessarily, right, to the current site. Um, with a new location for the building. And there are modifications to the traffic flow. And um, I'm wondering if a traffic study has been done um, to kind of weigh the impact of people coming and going at, this, at that same like point uh, uh, at the intersection. Yeah, a, a traffic study has been done. Um, part of the separation of car and bus traffic was to mitigate the congestion at uh, the entrance and exit to the site. Um, with all of the traffic now entering and exiting the cars, I should say, at the northern entrance, we have moved that entrance to the south to the extent possible to um, move it away from the intersection of, of Main and, and South East Street, where there is significant queuing. Um, but our attempts to mitigate those stop at the property line and then you know, connections to the, the intersection and other stuff that is done on the street will, is in the purview of the town. And have, they have told us that, so. I appreciate that. It's definitely, um, as a place that I have to pass through on my way to work every day, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's notable. Um, yeah, I appreciate the um, kind of contiguous nature of the playing fields and the um, playground spaces and love an outdoor classroom. I think that that kind of using the landscape as a teaching is a really wonderful thing, and I'm glad that that's been part of your scope as well. <laughs> Lindsay, any comments from you on on uh, landscape? My only, I mean, I, I agree with everything else and said. I my only question was on the area where there's some kind of raised seating. It's like it looks like concrete bench seating. Um, I don't know if we could go back to that image, but just to better understand the use of that sure. landscape. Um, here or to the north of the building? Right there. Um, it looks like there's some planters that kind of around that center circle. Yeah, so the radial the radial array mm -hmm. is planters, uh, maybe not rendered as verdant as they should be, but um, they're in addition to 
the planters. There is also uh, what is intended to be a pollinator garden. Um, so that's just uh, species growing in the ground that are uh, amenable to uh, pollinators uh, that all the forms that they take. Um, and then there is an area of trees that were used on site that are going to be cut into benches um, in addition to here, in addition to the outdoor seating area. So Tim, can I ask for a clarification? When you say planters, do you mean like garden boxes? Garden planters, yes. Um, we had originally proposed wooden constructed, but uh, the um, director of the uh, science curriculum um, corrugated metal is how they're going to be because they are um, the easiest maintain, the last longest, and um, honestly replaceable for the lowest amount if that should become necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I, I wonder, I, I just I question kind of the design of that of that space and how, you know, how fully it's been developed at this point, if this is something that's still in progress or if this is kind of the final layout. Uh, I'm going to go to the site plan just to, so we can get a better view of it to look at it. But um, to answer that question, these drawings have been submitted to the Conservation Commission. Um, the areas that are um, pervious and impervious, um, we would hope to change as little as possible. Um, the arrangement of planters, I, I think, would be one of the things that we certainly could change. Can you see my screen? You see the plans? Yeah, we see the, the building plans. Site plans. There we go. So here we go. Oh, one second, sorry. Zooming around a little bit. Okay. So these paths are um, impervious, but the area around the planter garden itself is stone dust, um, and the arrangement of the planters is what we have proposed, but um, it's certainly something that we could revisit. But in general, you know, given the fact that we are already before Conservation Commission and planning, we would like to make as few changes to the plan as possible. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I I just question the, the layout in terms of visibility. I mean, if that is, if the intention is that someone is going to be instruct instructing a group of people from that center point, is that kind of the vision? Well, there are actually enough planters there for two classes, um, and then the structure is enough for one. And so, you know, we haven't gotten to the into the curriculum at that granular or excuse me level, but um, you know, my understanding of the way the program is works is that you know kids with obviously some oversight will be working at the planter beds, but the actual instruction would happen in the classroom. But if there is uh, an arrangement of planter beds that are more conducive to teaching outside, they can certainly be rearranged within the space, but we would have to revisit that with the, the educators who have seen this. Okay, I, I would be curious what other people think, especially Erica, you teach, so I'm curious about your thoughts on the the layout and how conducive it may or may not be to kind of outdoor collaboration or discussion or work. Sure. Um, and I and I just wanted to add one other note, which was, and I, I'm not sure if you mentioned this and I missed it, but are, is there a, a garden area or an intention for an outdoor space where kids are learning about planting and, and gardening? So there's the planter gardens here. There is a pollinator garden adjacent to it. This is a microforest, so it's going to be saplings, and um, it's more about the forest floor. So you can turn over logs, and there's bugs and stuff underneath it. Um, and then this is uh, a rain garden, so it's a storm functioning stormwater feature. But there's a path around it in the viewing platform, so. Um, you can look at the sort of species that uh, exist and grow in that sort of environment. So all of these areas are intended to be tied into the curriculum and uh, they have various forms okay. of vegetation. 
Great. Well, that's really helpful to understand. I'm sorry if I missed that. Um, so the intention is not just for it to be a landscape element, but really to be an educational opportunity for uh, um, growing Absolutely. food and other mm -hmm. uh, biodiverse. Okay, that's great. Um, yeah, yeah I so think... I just question the, the layout in particular. Mm -hmm. I think I'm, I'm inclined to default to the science instructors and the kind of food education coordinator uh, on this one. I think that if they're low enough and that they are all kind of radiating from a center point, then that does give somebody the opportunity to like either, you know, have a group of kids gather around one planter box or instruct from the center as you suggested, Lindsay. So. Um, that outdoor learning area that's kind of radially organized. Um, it feels kind of formal in in this particular landscape, but I can I can understand why it is. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple of questions since we're on this particular slide. Um, one is just to kind of understand what scope of this outdoor space is accessible. Um, and then the other is to if you could describe a little bit about how that service entrance is being um, shielded, uh, how how um, how it's going to work when a, a delivery of food for the cafeteria arrives or something like that. Sure, um, the entire site is accessible, um, meaning that uh, from the entrance of the site, um, all curbs will be flush and provide an accessible path um, at drop-off, uh, crossing all of the trays in sight. The grade of all of these paths is such that you can get anywhere without um, you know, going beyond uh, MAAB um, prescribed grade. The connection between the portable, the port in place playground surface, the basketball courts, they are all flush um, the paving surface varies, uh, vehicular concrete, but mostly bituminous, but the entire system of paths, excuse me, is contiguous and accessible. Um, Thank you. and then the service area, and I apologize for this being green, that was not meant to be any sort of sleight of hand here. This is, uh, this is in fact paved. There are dumpsters and a transformer here. Um, and actually I think I'm going to go back to the video because you can get a better sense. Uh, yeah, I apologize for parking a bus in front of it, but um, there is a fence that connects, or I should say blocks um, the entrance from the service area. And then another one to the west we did mm -hmm. discuss having an opening or sliding gate with Rupert, the director of facilities and the rest of the staff. Um, and then for reasons of snow removal, uh, the fact that they didn't think anyone would open and close it, you would basically be there open the entire time. The, and then they're also to, to create an aperture large enough that I trash hauler could get in, pick up the dumpsters and remove, um, you know, it would be a very large gate opening. Uh, the consensus was that that gate would just exist in the open position the entire time. And if it was closed, it would interfere with uh, snow removal. So we elected to have no gate. So if you are passing and looking directly at the building, you will be able to see the service entrance and the bins. But what? the, go ahead, sir. Oh, I was just going to ask the material of the gate. Like, could it handle being backed into by a, a trash truck? Or so, in addition to the gate, everywhere that the trash truck is going, especially the the transformer, and maybe you can see it, there are bollards yeah. to prevent that movement. So, um, yeah. this is not fully up to date, but there are there is a triangular continuation of the planting bed here, um, and bollards blocking the path. Thank you for bringing me 
up to date on that. And um, does anybody else have comments about the, the landscape? Comments or questions? I just, it's not about the landscape, but but it seems that this is the bus entrance. Yes. And so, so there would be specific times during the day when children would be released to a bus under supervision of staff. And so is there a conversation about scheduling deliveries at a, at a different, at times other than when the buses are there and the children are, are going to buses? Yes, there has been that conversation and, and that is how they operate now and how they intend to continue to operate that deliveries will be not, will not arrive on site when there is bus and car traffic. And one of the reasons that the service entrance is on the bus loop and not the car route. So buses are more predictable, as you say, than cars, someone coming to pick up. So there should never be a situation where there's a little free and it's interfering with a, a car, a parent picking up or dropping off whatever time of day that may be. So that, that is why it's on the bus loop and why the bus loop is separated from the car loop. Thank you. Okay, and I promise some redundancy. The next the next uh, factor is uh, building scale. The scale of a structure or landscape alteration should be compatible with its architectural or landscape design style and character and that of the surrounding. The scale of ground level design elements, such as building entryways, windows, porches, plazas, parks, pedestrian furniture, plantings, and other street and site elements should be determined by and directed toward their use, comprehension, and enjoyment of pedestrians. So Catherine had a comment earlier about the scale of the entry and appreciation of kind of pulling those down. Um, does anybody else have a comment that might fit into the scale category? I think also Lindsay's comment about the intersecting planes of the roof. Yeah. So that you, 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 you it, it doesn't, look massive in in the bulky sense it has it has design features that create um roof and 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 a cladding side you know the bricks that break it up a little bit so that it's got interesting um areas and not just one massive structure yeah. one of the things that i'm wrestling with a little bit is the the need for um, security and um, kind of uniformity around the the, the classroom block um, and the the way that you um, articulated individual classrooms with the color, right? I, I love the introduction of color here, and I suppose that might fit into the next category as well, but. Um, how does the how does the architect um, balance the need for the security of the kids inside the building and maybe not making an individual classroom recognizable from the outside in the event of the worst possible scenario, right? Um, and then also the kind of saying like, oh, my classroom is the one with the green. It, it absolutely is a tough balance. I mean, we have very um, difficult conversations about this. Um, and then to the extent possible, we build as much into the building to prevent the unthinkable. I mean, I, I the, you know, just to, as a, a back out overview of the security features, the lobby is um, video phone controlled. Uh, so you cannot get into the building unless you're buzzed in, unless there is staff at the overall building doors, they are locked at all times. As I mentioned in the plan walkthrough, the classroom wing itself is, um, locked off or potentially can be locked off from the rest of the building. Um, I will add that, um, there is security film on the first floor windows with sills that are below three feet so that it impedes anyone trying to get into the building in, in a way that they shouldn't. Um, but you're absolutely right that a very explicit map to a certain location in the building is not something that we want to advertise, but we also want to give, you know, the kids, as you pointed out, the ability to, to look at the building and say, that's, that's where my classroom is. And then we're, we're not really talking about the inside of the building, but we do a similar thing on the inside. So by 
project area and by floor, the coloring of the materials, the flooring, the paint on the walls, the light fixtures, which are some colors, um, sort of give you a grid, a uh, way finding a sense of where you are in the building simply by color alone. Um, and, you know, uh, we've heard actually from the Accessibility Commission that that is a good thing. So uh, we have to balance all of these discussions and hopefully not push too far in one direction or the other, but we, we think we've achieved a balance. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that. I recognize that it's a really difficult and maybe increasingly difficult terrain to navigate and we've done a nice job with it, so thanks. Um, okay, uh, directional expression. <laughs> Building facades and other architectural and landscape design elements shall be compatible with those of others in the surrounding area with regard to the dominant vertical or horizontal direction, uh, expression or direction related to the use of historic or cultural character as appropriate. I have no comments. Anybody else? Okay, so here's the fun one. Um, architectural and site details. Architectural and site details, including signs, lighting, pedestrian furniture, plantings and paving, along with materials, colors, textures, and grades shall be treated so as to be compatible with original architectural landscape design style of the structure or site to preserve and enhance the character of the surrounding area. There's some additional comments about downtown building uh, downtown districts, which I can uh, ignore. Um, and I know tonight you're not presenting signage and you're not presenting uh, lighting, but I will say for, for myself, I'm uh, excited about the the color on the building, the kind of the orange fascia and the um, glazed concrete tile around the classroom windows. Um, appreciate the brick mix to soften the scale of the um, the wall when you have a big expanse of brick. Um, yeah. Intrigued by that. Lindsay, go ahead. Yeah, as I said, I think the use of color is, is great, um, especially with the fascia and the wrapping. Um, I was curious about the mortar. I think that the images you showed of the um, the tile, the concrete um, composite material that is the different colors. Mm. Is that actually going to be white or is, is it going to be more um, of a color match to the actual panels? Uh, very astute observation. Our intent is to do a color match mortar. Those are the colors from the catalog pages for those particular materials. Um, um, the thing about color match mortar, it's not always perfect, um, but uh, it will, as close as we get it, it will certainly be closer than a contrast white. The intent is not to have a contrast mortar. Okay, I just wanted to check on that. Um, and then I also, and this is a very subjective, just to my eye, um, I felt that the, the massing of that media center is really, um, feels feels appropriate in the scale and that it kind of pops up. But I was curious about the choice of materials there, um, that it is kind of more of a muted. And is that is that primarily because the scale and the massing is so kind of such a focal point, it's been kind of like draws your eye already? Or was there an intention to not having a color accent that wraps that that mass, that volume? Uh, that's a good point. And uh, if we shared all of the iterations of the project, you would see that at one point we had three very distinct colors for the main entrance, which was orange, the gym was sort of a bluish green, and the media center was a third color. Um, and it seemed like too much. Uh, I mean, if, if we're getting into the realm of very subjective, um, this way, the one color um, is allowed to stand on its own. And then the crisp nature of the uh, composite panel, the sort of the contemporary edge around a, uh, a, a masonry facade still is there and it defines the volume, but it doesn't compete 
with the entrance is the thinking behind the color selection being very vibrant and popping at the main entrance and being somewhat so more subdued at the gym and the media center. <clears throat> Patricia, Catherine, thoughts on architectural elements category? Well, I agree with the comments about the uh, various materials and also the, the design of the, particularly of the entrance. I think it's just going to make just a really welcoming uh, uh, experience and as much color as you can use on the exterior. Um, I would highly endorse it. Uh, we need more color and, I don't know, uh, a feeling of joy and anticipation. And I think this is the way to do it. Yeah, I I agree, Catherine. And I, I think it goes back to my comments about differentiating the various um, areas of the building. It It makes it look interesting as opposed to a three-story block of of brick, and um, it, it brings some some um, whimsy to it in, in some ways for an elementary school. So, I I just kind of round up what everybody else has said. Great. Um, and I have one question: Has there been any provision made for the the mural that is currently it was fairly recently? Uh, designed and installed as a community effort on the existing Fort River school entrance. Has there been any discussion about ways to repurpose that in this particular case? You talked about art on the outside of the building. Um, we have discussed it. Um, we don't have a home for it as it were right now. We have talked about, well, one, if it were to be long-term, it would have to be on the inside just based on the width. I believe it's painted. Mm -hmm. Um plywood and and you know this is this is a generational building it's not going to last a generation on the outside um we've you know, on other projects we have scanned existing artwork and printed it that would be one way to keep it we do have idea areas identified on the inside that we have not yet established the art um but i mean a short answer to the question is it's not fully resolved if it will be kept or where it would live but we do have places identified on the exterior which i showed in the fly around at the music room and a few on the interior that could um foster or or um be the area where this is maintained okay. um all right so i think you know as, as far as the drb is concerned i'd love to have it um on the record that we appreciate that the uh, kind of rehoming or reconceiving that mural is is part of this process. I'm sure that the building planning committee is part of that as well. But uh, let's see. Okay, and you haven't. Um, we haven't been reviewing uh, lighting fixtures, but you did provide a location plan and a mm -hmm. photometric plan, which seems appropriate um i we can't really judge the design of it um may, maybe at the point when you're ready to do um kind of exterior building signage site signage and, and and lighting and furnishings you might be coming back to the drb so we oh, can put a whole certainly on open that. to that yeah. um yeah, and then the, the last category is is signs, and you mentioned that like the building hasn't even been named yet, so you've provided a location for the sign, but there really isn't. It's not a part of this proposal, so um, we don't really have much to discuss there. So, um, and now I'd open the floor to uh, comments that haven't fit within the scope of anything that we've talked about already. Um, don't want to leave those out. So if you have other thoughts. Uh, DRB members that you wish to share, just speak up. Okay. And Rob, are there any members of the public present tonight? Would anybody like to speak before we 
move this forward. So I'm seeing three individuals in attendance. Uh, none of them have their hands raised. So I'm assuming they do not wish to uh, provide any public comment. All right, we'll, we'll pause just for a moment in case anybody changes their mind. Mm -hmm. All right, and I think um, I'm thinking through our comments and there weren't, there were a few questions which were answered pretty clearly um, by Mr. Cooper. Would anybody like to summarize any recommendations that you made that I may have missed because I didn't besides my interest in the in the mural I didn't hear any specific recommendations for Denisco. I don't remember hearing any either Erica and I thought Lindsay was going to bring one up with the mortar color situation but it seemed that they were going to blend it in with the existing color of the brick so um I I don't have any that I wrote down but of course if other members had some they want me to to keep note of, I guess you could bring it up. I would have made a suggestion, but you're already doing it. So it's <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's well then suggestion. Um then I suppose we could have a, a motion to approve the design as proposed. Um uh with the one recommendation to uh, make accommodations for the existing mural. And we also know that you're coming back. So would anybody like to make a motion? I so move. Thank you. A second? Second. Thank you, Pat. Any discussion? Okay, hearing none. All those in favor of approve, uh, approving the motion? Please say aye. Aye. That is a unanimous vote. Thank you for making you. this an easy discussion for us. Um, I <laughs> gather that we will be seeing you again down the road. Um, thanks for making this happen for our town. Yeah. Well, thank you. You're a great town to work for. Thank you. Thank you. It's very exciting. Thank you. OK. Let's see, finding my way back to the right screen. <laughs> Agenda. Meeting minutes. Thank you, by the way, ERB Thank members. You. This is, it's a slog to get through all of the questions in such a mm -hmm. orderly, kind of like respected way, but I appreciate um, your willingness to do that. Um, we appreciate you, Eric, to make okay. it happen. <gasps> Okay, let's see. So uh, meeting minutes is the next stop. Um, we have the minutes from November 27. We had, uh, this was our last meeting. We just had the one, um, the one project to review, which was a revisit of um, the, I'm totally at a loss for words today. Uh, Hickory Ridge. Thank you. Oh, Hickory Ridge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the I put the 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 minutes up on the screen. Um, I'll leave the bulk of it here for y'all to to skim. Um, I did have a comment. Uh huh. And it's it's open to discussion, but my feeling is to just. Um, not specify the ADA requirements, but rather to just keep it general and say that um, here. Yeah, so there, I think, and and also that the the handrails aren't. So there's there's a guardrail, and there's yeah. a handrail. Right. So the guardrail is like the you know the the part of the railing that. Um, has the whole kind of like framework and then the handrail is just the whole thing you hold on to. So um, so the guardrail is kind of what I was imagining could come down at a 45 degree angle. 
-hmm. That's really just a design suggestion. Um, I mean, there is some protection value, but it's not a it's not an ADA thing. Um, the handrail coming out a foot is an ADA thing, um, and I guess that um, so. But there's a, there are there are nuances to it. So like it has to return to the structure. Right. I don't think we need to spell any of that out. I think if we just say to ensure that the handrails um, and guardrails meet ADA requirements, that's sufficient. Um, and the 45 degree angle, that's what I would leave up to discussion. Like if that's an aesthetic idea that we want to include as a specific design suggestion, or if that's just a, a thought that you know, was put out there. I just don't want, want I don't want it to be confused right in the language, um, making it sound like that's part of an ADA requirement. What the one foot out is, correct? It is, but I I okay. guess my thought is is to not specify that, rather to just say that it needs to be ADA compliant because there are okay. additional elements to the handrail guardrail. Uh, requirements that we're not specifying here so I think yeah. just so just make it more general and less specific mm -hmm. okay yeah. now that makes sense I could change that yeah thanks Rob Lindsay I think that's a really good point like because if you specify one small component of ADA mm -hmm. compliance and then not others then it, it could be confusing so we just want the whole handrail assembly and design to be ADA compliant mm -hmm. Um, and then a suggestion to have the guardrail slope down at the ends at a 45 degree angle. I think that was met with, you know, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly, the whole, everybody on the, on the committee was, thought that was a nice idea. And so I, I don't have any objection to keeping that part yeah. in. It's just kind of a separate piece from the ADA. Yeah. So the part about the ramps, um, should I take that out too? Yeah, because I think that the 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 ramp wasn't um, the image that they shared with us did mm -hmm. not show the ramp, but it's definitely part of the design. Like it's that's they they spoke about the the ramp up to the actual um, footbridge as being mm -hmm. something that's on the way. Yeah. Um, Chris, I see you have a comment. Hi. Yeah. Um, thank you for recognizing me, Chris Brestrup, planning director. So. Um, I believe that the final plans do not show any ramps. What they show is a very slight incline up towards the footbridges or whatever it is that yeah. needs to be accommodated. And um, none of those um, access points are over 5%, so they wouldn't need any type of handrail. So that's what the final decision was. Thanks for so, that clarification. Thank you. Yeah, I, I guess we could just make it really general and just say, you know, make sure that all, you know, ramps um, are ADA accessible, meet ADA requirements. And I think we can just leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'll continue to scroll down a little bit so you can see the the rest of the minutes. And that was it. Is there a motion to approve with uh, changes to our uh, recommendations? I move to approve with changes noted to the recommendations. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Please say aye. aye. Let's know. Great. <clears throat> That's everyone. Okay. Quickly back to the agenda. Any other business? No, except that uh, a Botanica, is it Botanica? The, the, Botanica uh, Home. Yeah. 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 Got the new, she has her new awning. Uh, sadly, it, the whimsy of the bird on top of the letter didn't make it, but uh, it's nice and bright and blue and uh, certainly stands out. So, yeah. yeah. 
Great, folks. So uh, we'll see you after the new year at some point. I wish you all a warm winter holiday season. You too. Thank, Thank you. you. And to everybody. Thank you, everybody. Let Thank you all. Turn. Okay, ciao. Okay. Thank you. Take and care. Chris, I wanted to say to you, I, I do owe you a response to your email that you sent me a few weeks ago, and I will get back to you. Great. Okay. Thank okay. you. Sorry, it's taken me so long. Okay. No bye. worries. Take care.